Um, I was just looking around and, and seeing different people. Um, welcome, Mrs. Herlow. We've been praying for you. It's good to see you here today. And um, Mr. Bell, Adrian Bell, he, um, he was my English teacher. <laughs> He's a rather tortured looking man now. Um, but uh, he was my English teacher and taught me, um, yeah, w what I know about English. But it's not his fault. I, I probably missed a lot of stuff. But um, it's really nice to see Adrian Bell. He had a huge impact on my life, mate, and, a, and a really, um, it's really good to see you. Shanae, welcome. It's good to see Shanae um, here. And, you know, we were in Sydney last week with Day 7, and it's always neat when you're in a different place and you see people that you know, and, and there was Shanae with her beautiful smile and her beautiful boyfriend, I mean, beautiful smile, um, <laughs> just sitting up there, and, um, and, and it's just, just good. Just good, and it's good to see you all here this morning. I loved worship this morning. It's beautiful, and I love it every, every Sabbath, you know, but it felt special this morning. Um, 23rd Psalm, okay. So I realized that here this morning, we um, no doubt in a, in, a, in a crowd like this, we have people who are at different places in life, and this is called Life verse, and it's my life verse. It's, it's a verse that means a lot to me, and my, my, I guess my purpose this morning is to share with you why it means a lot to me, and hopefully it'll, some of it lands with you. Uh, I'm sure we've got people here who are in different walks with Jesus Christ. Um, some, some, there's people here who are skeptics about Jesus Christ. That's all good. There are some here who are culturally, religiously into church, and that's all good. Lovely to have you here. There are some who have, don't have a belief in Jesus Christ, maybe, and you're just, just here to have a little listen. You're welcome. Here's the thing that I want us all to know. We're all in the same boat. No one's better than anybody else. And, and I, I just hope that something that I share with you this morning um, lands, lands really well with you. But what I'd like you to do, what I'd like us all to do, for starters, is I'd like us all to repeat the 23rd Psalm. Because, and I'd like us to repeat it in the old language, because this is how I learned it. I learned it in the old King James Version. If I try to repeat it in any other version, I get lost. I can only say it like this, with these and thous. So if you're not used to KJV, to, to King James Version, um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall. I don't know if you know about that word. Not what he Maketh just means make. Is that all right? And, and stuff like leadeth just means lead. You know, just for I'm speaking of all our young people up there, it's the same, same, you know, but it's just said in a different way. But I'd love to hear us all say it, just, just to say it through, you know, and let the, let the words wash over you and let them mean whatever they mean to you. Maybe it conjures up memories for you as, the, as it does for me when I repeat the 23rd Psalm. Are we ready? Can we do this? On the count of three, one, two, three. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. lovely to hear it. It's lovely to hear it. As, as um, Norm asked me to, to, to speak this morning, and I had to think about what my life verse was, it didn't take me long to come up with this. And, and as I read it, and, and just preparing for today, um, I must say that I think this is one of the wonderful things about the Word of God. Every time you read something, you think you know it, and then you read it again, and you see something different, and it's just, just awesome, and I want to share some of those things um, with you this morning. But I'll tell you why this, this verse resonates with me. This was the verse, this was the psalm that I would use often in an incredibly formative time in my life. The incredibly formative time in my life was when, for some reason, I decided at the age of 19 that I was going to be a literature evangelist. <laughs> now... If you don't know what a literature evangelist is, I've got to say, 
I still think, and I've had a bit of work experience in my few years of working, I, I still think it is the most scariest thing that a human being can do. Because what a literature evangelist does is a literature evangelist walks up cold turkey to a door and they knock on the door and they speak to people about what they're selling and what they're selling are religious books. Like, that's kind of scary. And I don't know what possessed me except to say that I think God was leading because when you look back, you know, you just go, hey, man. At the time, my dad said to me, son, literature evangelists have to speak and you don't speak a lot. You, you, you can hardly talk. <laughs> and, and I was like that. I was so uh, uh, into myself. You know, I talked to my mates, but I wouldn't talk to anybody else. And my dad said, son, you, what do you want to do that for? You have to do a lot of talking, and you're pretty quiet, mate. And I said, well, yeah, I don't know. I'm just going to sign up and have a go. So I did. <clears throat> so this verse went like this. Here I am, sitting outside on the street in my car, with my bag of books. The, bag, the bags are heavy. It's like got big Bibles in it. It's like got children's stories in it. It's like got medical books in it because I know all about medical stuff. And, uh, and I'm sitting there with my bag of books and I start repeating this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You know why I'm repeating this? You know why I'm, I'm, I'm going over this in my mind? It's because I'm trying to go to my happy place. Because right now I'm not in my happy place. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to remember better days. And this is how I eat. This is how I have to live. And I don't like talking to people. Oh, crazy. And I'm sitting there, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now I'm getting out of the car. And as I'm getting out of the car and I'm walking towards the first door, I'm going, yay, though he leads me through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear. I'm going, oh, I can't. Yay, though he leads me. Here's the door. Through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Knock, knock, knock. Whew. And I repeated that and I would say it. That's why I know it, because I'd say it to myself all the time. I get to the door. Here's the cool thing about being a literature evangelist. They gave you five pages of lines to remember. Like, you had to learn them verbatim. But they gave you, like, three or four options for greeting people. Like, you, you could say, good morning, how are you? My name is such and such. I'm from the Home Health Education Service. You could do that. But there was this quirky one that I used to really like. And I thought, no, I think, I think I'll try this quirky one. And it went like this. Good morning. I suppose you're wondering who your visitor is. And then you'd pause. See, and then that answer, hopefully... And they'd say something, but because the psychology was that if they answer you back, you're in. You're in. If they answer you back, they want to interact, hey, you're in. So I thought, oh, I like that one. I try. Good morning. I suppose you're wondering who your visitor is. And nine times out of ten, they go, yes, actually, I was wondering who would be knocking at my door at this time of the morning. <laughs> and then I'd say who I was and what I was doing. Well, you know, if you've ever, ever learned anything rote, um, sometimes you get it mixed up. And this happened to me. I'm saying my verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Get to my first door. Knock, knock, knock. Lady opens the door. And I say, good morning. I guess you're wondering who you are. <laughs> so, there's this uncomfortable pause. I didn't even realize what I had said. I just thought I had said, I suppose you're wondering who your visitor is. And you know, as you retract and you think over what you just said, I said to her, did I just ask you who you think you are? And she said, yeah, you did. I said, I'm really sorry. I sold books to her, by the way. Um, I'll never forget it. And, uh, and, we, uh, uh, and that was great. Um, one time, we went to Richard's hometown, Dunedin. And uh, we used to do these outreaches, you know. And, and, I went, and, and Dunedin's not like Christchurch. Christchurch, you can whip around, you know, get to a few houses. Dunedin's like this. It's like that. And I remember going, and we were climbing, the bags are heavy, and I'm trudging up, and I'm puffing, 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 and I knock on the door. I should have waited, but I knock on the door. She opens the door straight away, and I'm just standing there going, <sighs> I didn't sell books to her. <laughs> so get out. <laughs> um, man, th that's why this means a lot to me, this verse, because it reminds me of a scary time in my life where I grew exponentially because... Well, I had to survive, 
And um, I just learned so much about myself and I learned heaps about walking through dark times with God. Um, just a little bit of background to the 23rd Psalm. David wrote this psalm when he was a political fugitive. Um, I guess Kim.com is kind of like a political fugitive right now in this country, although he's probably having a feast in the presence of his enemies right now. But, um, you know, um, the guy Assange, who, who does all the secret stuff, you know, political ref, uh, refugee. David was a political refugee. Saul, the king of Israel, was after him to kill him, and he had put the word out, if you see this guy, David, kill him. See, being a political refugee these days is not so bad. You just probably get to go to jail. But being a political refugee in David's day was like you die. And I want you to imagine him as he starts to pen this psalm, sitting in a cave in a dark place. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Can you see how David is remembering when he was a boy as a shepherd, remembering the beautiful green grass, remembering how God was with him, remembering how he was free? This is the context of this psalm. And all around him, there are enemies who are trying to, to kill him. Here's one thing I notice about this psalm, and that's the form of it. If I go back to the beginning, can we, sorry, just, just to that verse, um, to the psalm is the, the, the way that the psalm is written. Can we go back? Yeah, thanks. Um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Here's David, he's, he's talking about God. And, and when we're in green pastures, when we're in a good place in life, when things are going well, I think we tend to talk about God a lot. We tend to talk about Him. But then the form changes when he starts to go through the valley. And can we go to the next slide? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no, for you are with me. He stops talking about God, and he starts talking to God. You see how, how the form changes. In the green pastures, we tend to talk about a lot about God. But when we're going through the valley, through the tough times, we tend to talk to God. And, and there's a bit of a difference. <clears throat> you know... Um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I, I can't wonder what that, that means. I shall not want? Does that mean I'll never need anything? Does that mean I'll never desire anything? This is what I believe it means when I look at other texts in the Bible, like Philippians 4.19 and Psalms 84.11. This is what I think I shall not want means. God's leading means I will lack nothing of the things God knows are good for me. God's leading means that me wanting nothing means that I will lack nothing of the things God knows is good for me. That's a little different to thinking that this means I won't need anything anymore or I won't desire anything anymore. See, I still desire my family. I still desire to have a good life. I still desire. I've got some things that I want to achieve. But here's what he promises. God promises that I will lack nothing of the things that God knows is good for me. Can I tell you something? I have everything around me that is good for me. I might not realize that I need it, but everything around me that I have is good for me if I let God lead my life. Karen is good for me. My wife is good for me. She's good for me. You know why? I I've got a little defect in my character. <laughs> Actually, I've got a few. <laughs> One of the more notable ones is that I'm not very good with a diary or a calendar or iCal. You know, I just... Uh, it just doesn't sit with me. I don't. So God gives me someone like Karen who's good for me. And that's not the only thing, but that's the only thing I can talk about with you today. But she's good for me, you know? She's good for me in so many other ways. I'm the kind of guy, and I don't know if anyone else is here like me, um, but I, I'm really like, um, um, what's the word? Um, I'll do things like off the cuff, heaps. I'm spontaneous, yes, I'm, that's a nice word for it. Other people have called it something else. Um, I'm very, I'm a spontaneous kind of guy. For example, I remember we, uh, one time we, we went and I took Sanitarium, I took our sales team and I said, hey, let's go do something team. And we played um, paintball. We went to this paintball place in Taupo. 
And uh, they sent us this stuff before we went to paintball, and they said, hey, listen, you need to wear the right gear. You need to wear stuff that's going to kind of protect you because the paintball's kind of hurt. And if you've got some camouflage, you know, that'll be really cool. Well, I rock up, and I'm wearing a red T-shirt. That's it. On, and, and trousers. I was wearing a red T-shirt. And I'm just rocking up like this. All the boys have got the camo gear on. Some of them have got armor. They're looking, man, I'm rocking up with a T-shirt. <laughs> wow. All right, let's go. So anyway, you know, I see these guys that are creeping around. You know, they're really patient because they're creeping around. They're going the long way. They're climbing trees, being really strategic. I'm just like, give me a gun. Let's go. And I'm just charging at the opposite. I can see the flag that we're supposed to get. And I just want to get it. You know, I came back after that. And Karen remembers I came home. Uh, I got the prize for the most shot ever. Red t-shirt, red and green bush, you know. <laughs> just shot everywhere and badly. And there were massive welts and stuff. And I'm kind of like that, but God gives me Karen, you know, to kind of calm me down a bit. Um, he gives me Hannah, my daughter, to kind of, you know, Hannah's the one in my family that kind of says, oh, Dad, that's not cool. She keeps me, keeps me G. <laughs> and I said, that's, that, that's not cool, you know. Caleb is good for me. He's going to be good for me tomorrow because he's going to protect me on the rugby league field tomorrow. I'm glad he's a big guy. And, uh, but he's good for me. He keeps me real. Leah's good for my soul because when I see her lead worship and when I see her sing, oh. <sighs> you have everything around you if you let God lead you, that is good for you. You may not have everything you want or everything that you compare that other people have, but everything that you need that is good for you, you have around you if you let God lead you. Here's a warning about green grass. Here's a warning about green grass. When you think about this text and it talks about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Here's the trap that we can fall into. The trap is this, that we can fall in love with the green grass. I call it lifestyle. We can fall in love with the picture of still waters. And the problem with that is that later on, when the leader, when God, when the shepherd says this, hey, now it's time to go through the dark valley, we're like, no, I like the green grass. I want to stay by the still waters because it's nice. That's the danger of the green pasture. When you read this text, what you should be seeing, I believe, what you should be seeing is that the green grass is a metaphor for Jesus Christ. And that the still waters is a metaphor for Jesus Christ. It's not like the green grass. It's not like the lifestyle. It's like a metaphor for the best lifestyle that you can have, which is laying down in Jesus Christ. Green grass and still waters. Be careful that you don't fall in love with it. You need to fall in love with who it represents, this Jesus Christ. I love how it talks about he restores my soul. Restoration can only be found in Jesus. Can, I have an example of restoration. Come, Levi. Thanks, mate. I was wondering what restoration means, and I looked it up in the Hebrew, and it tends to mean this. Um, I need a helper. Jaden, Jaden, can you come and help me, mate? Come on, come up here. You see, there's a few of you who are like this today, maybe a little deflated, maybe just a little flat. Here's the problem with flat. That's the problem with flat. Sorry, mate. <laughs> like, when you're flat, you find it hard to play in the game when you're flat. And this psalm says he wants to restore our soul. Jaden, can we restore this? Here's what the Hebrew restore means um, as I was reading it. Hold that, buddy. Restore means to return to the place of your departure. That's what it means in Hebrews. In Hebrew. Is that working? I might have, should probably got a bigger pump, bigger restorer. I'm not jiggling, you know. <coughs> you know, 
Um, the word restore, he restores my soul, means exactly this, that you need to return to the place of your departure. There are some here this morning who started well with Jesus Christ, gave your life to him, felt his spirit in your life, and then you departed and went on your own journey for a wee while. And maybe you're here a little deflated this morning. What the psalm says is that the God that we serve, the God that we follow, is a God that wants to pump you back up again. Amen? He wants to pump you back up again. Because once you're pumped up, once you have been restored to the place of your departure, as defined in the Hebrew, this is what you can do with your life. Do you want to do something? Do you want to kick it or something? Hmm. Yeah, you can play with it. And it can roll. And it goes places. When you're flat, you can't do anything. Life is just flat. And so this psalm says to me that the God that I follow, what God wants to do in my life is he wants to restore me. Thanks, buddy. He wants to restore me to the place of my departure for where I departed from him. If there's anyone here this morning that is feeling that they need restoration, um, let God lead you. Let him lead you. Let him pump you back up again. I often wonder why, uh, why God would lead you through a valley. I mean, why would he do that? Now, some people are like, so does God create the valley so he can lead you through it? Well, that's kind of, hmm, why would he do that? Why would God lead you through a valley? And, and here's my simplistic kind of understanding of it as I was reading this this week. I believe God wants to lead you through the valley because there's always a valley between point A and point B. If point A is where he comes to you and he leads you, and point B is, as the rich young ruler said, how is it that I go about having eternal life in between where he picks you up in eternal life? There's always a valley. You've got to get there. And he has promised to lead you through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He wants to walk with you through the valley. Here's another thing, that I, a picture that I really like. Because he goes on to say this, my rod and my staff, they comfort you. Levi, can you bring up the uh, other props? Here's a picture that I get when I read about the rod and the staff. This is my staff. This is my rod. All right. So when our leader, when God says, the way we're going to walk through the valley is I'm going to lead you with my rod and my staff. There's two things that he does. One thing is this. <clears throat> he uses his staff just to guide you. Just to guide you. Hey, hey, you're going a little bit crooked. Come here, come here. Just guide you like this. Just guide you along. But sometimes you get really sidetracked. Like you see something that is dark, but it looks like light because you've been on drugs. <laughs> and it looks, woo. And you're like, wow. I want to chase after that. That looks really cool. Then he brings out his rod. I call it the donking stick. And he just goes, donk. He just like, hey, donk. Hey, mate, what are you doing? Come here. This is the wake-up stick. This is the wake-up stick. How many fathers do we have here? <laughs> yeah, amen. See, I really believe that God has endowed fathers with the ability to donk. <laughs> and, and the mandate to donk. See, it's not bash. It's just donk. <laughs> it's just, hey, hey, wake up. Hey, 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 where are you going? Hey, donk. Hey, hey, donk. Just a little donk. Hey, come on. Come on. And then he brings the staff. So his rod and his staff is for you. A and this verse says this. Hey, his rod and his staff, find comfort in it. Don't run away from it. Find comfort in it. When you've been donk, God is saying, hey, wake up, man. Hey, girl, wake up. Just donk. See, if you're going to live a life of alcohol or drugs, something's going to go wrong in your life. If, if, you, if, if that's going to be your lifestyle, something's going to go wrong, I can tell you now. Does God make it go wrong so he can donk you? No, you make it go wrong because you're making some dumb decisions. I'm not talking to all of you, obviously, right? But if you make dumb decisions, God is just going to donk you. Boom. Hey, wake up, man. You're going to have a bad experience. It's probably God donking you. Hey, wake up. That's one use. Here's the second use, and this use I really like. 
When you've decided as a follower of Jesus Christ to lean into him through the valley. Because this is what happens when you're scared. I had this experience, actually, just the other night. We were watching this program called Ridiculousness. And it's YouTube clips of really ridiculous things that happen. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And um, one of the clips was from Australia. And I don't know how many people know what a huntsman spider is. Yeah, it's huntsman spider. When we were living in Melbourne, I had two experiences with huntsman spiders, the freaky things. They're huge. They eat birds. So they're big. There's this huntsman spider on the wall, and we're watching this, and my family are there, and, we're, and you know something's going to happen, because it's called ridiculousness, right? And you know something's going to happen, and there's suspense. And this guy, what he does, this big huntsman spider on the wall, probably two of my hand spans, and he puts on a motorbike helmet, and he has a knife in one hand and a bowl in the other. <coughs> and he's walking up to this huntsman spider like this, you know? Knife in this hand, bowl in this hand, huntsman spider about that big on the wall. And he's about to, I, I guess he was going to trap it, and I don't know what he was going to do with a knife, but something with a knife, but I guess he was going to try and trap it. And just as he's getting close, the huntsman spider just poof, leaps out at him. <laughs> it was like, we were watching it. You know, um, the natural reaction that we have when we are in fear is that we lean into somebody who's next to us. And I was watching my... Uh, my um, my daughter and my wife, and they were like, Rrr! like that. Um, here's the thing that happens when you walk through the valley. This is why you should not try and stay in the green pastures. When you walk through the valley, you automatically, naturally lean into Jesus Christ. See, the thing with the running around in the pastures is that it's free and it's cool, and you're just running around, and, and God is over here somewhere. When you go through the valley with Jesus Christ, you, you lean into him naturally. <clears throat> and when you decide to give your life to Jesus Christ and you say, hey, will you lead me through the valley? Will you lead me through this tough time? This is what he does. He's donked you a couple of times. He's guided you. Now the role of the staff and the rod change from protecting you to smashing demons. It goes like this. <clears throat> he gets you and he holds you in here with his staff. Can you picture it? He holds you in here. Not because he's trying to keep you there. You want to be there. The reason he's holding you in there is because demons are trying to tear you away. Because stuff is trying to tear you away from him. The Bible tells us very clearly that Satan is like a roaring lion trying to devour you. And so he holds you in here close to him. That's the safest place. He's holding you here with his staff. And with his rod, he's doing this. Demon. Bang! Hits that one there. Bang! Hits that one there gets that one out of the way. And then it starts to get fun because you're like, wow, I'm with like Tayaha swinging warrior supreme. He's good, man. God is the man. And you start joining him. You say, hey, there's something coming up here. There's a bit of lust coming my way. Can you get that one? God says, yeah, sure. Bang. And he whacks that one. And he whacks that one. And he whacks that one, holding you close. His rod and his staff. And the word of God says, find comfort in it. The problem is when we see God's rod and when we see his staff, we tend to try and run away from it. So far we've been in green pastures, we've been through the dark valley, and now we're coming through to the other side. And David reaches this conclusion. He says this, hey, I can safely say, I can pretty much guarantee that if I let God lead me, through the times of green pastures, and if I let him lead me through the dark valley, something that I can pretty much guarantee is this, that he will follow me all the days of my life based on the green pasture experience and based on the dark valley experience. I can guarantee that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Now, here's the problem with the word follow. The word follow in English kind of denotes lagging behind. So you could read that and you could say, hey, after being through all that, is goodness and mercy always going to be lagging behind? Like, when is it ever going to catch up to me? Is it always going to be behind me? But the Hebrew for the word follow is this word radaf. And radaf means this. It means pursue. 
It doesn't mean lag behind, it means pursue. And it doesn't just mean pursue, it means pursue aggressively to dish out justice. This is a hot pursuit. Surely goodness and mercy will hotly pursue me and try to catch me. If I think of an analogy, it would go like this. Um, Joelle, what's your car, mate? What's your, what's your vehicle? What is it? It's a Holden. Is it fast? It can be fast. Would it be faster than a police car? You think so? Yeah. So Joelle has a Holden. And I want us to imagine a scenario. This is just imagining, because this is an analogy that I want to bring out here. I want you to imagine that later in life, Joelle gets married. You know, just, just pretending to Ashley. Just pretending. <laughs> Just, just pretending for the analogy. Let's say they get married. And often when you get married, I mean, I know when I got married, I was poor as. <laughs> My car was a Ford Escort, and it was just the... Um, and these guys get married, and let's say they don't have a lot of money. And then let's say they, they have some kids, you know, eight or nine, and, um, <coughs> and they're doing the whole family thing. You know, and Joelle is tired because he's so busy on the road trying to earn an income for the family. And he, he's so tired driving up and down the country doing what he does that he decides to stop off in a motel for the night. And he, before he gets back home to Auckland, he says, man, I'm just going to have a rest. He walks into the motel and there's a competition going. And the competition is leave your business card in the bowl and you could be drawn to win a trip to Hawaii. Now, Joelle, there's nothing more that he'd like than to give him and his family, they need a holiday. Boy, this, so he puts his business card in the bowl, not thinking anything will happen, and it's all good. And so anyway, he wakes up the next morning, jumps in his car, and he makes his way back up to Auckland. As he's driving along, he hears the most dreaded sound, whoop, whoop, it's the cop car. And for some dumb reason, Joelle, instead of stepping on the brake, he steps on the accelerator. And he says to himself, man, I can't afford a fine. That would be the worst thing. I've got to get out of here. And he steps on the gas of his Holden, which was just puttering along, really. <laughs> and he steps on it, and he tries to outrun the cop. Has anyone ever? No, anyway. And tries to outrun the cop. And this cop is gaining on him relentlessly. And while Joelle is doing this, through his mind, he's replaying all the tickets he's had. And suddenly he realizes, this is my third ticket. That's 90 plus demerit points or whatever it is and I'm going to lose my license, I've got to get rid of this guy, and he steps on each other, but to no avail. The cop car's got a souped-up V8 with scoop and spoilers and stuff, and he comes up and he pulls Joelle over. Joelle resigns himself to the fact that he's in trouble. Pulls over. Cop comes up to him, winds down the window, and says to Joelle, bit of a guilty conscience there, buddy. Joelle says, yeah, yeah, sorry, man, I don't know what I was doing. The cop then says, hey, I'll tell you why. I'm chasing you. Um, I just came out of that motel that you were staying in, and you left your wallet there. I've been trying to catch you to give you your wallet. Joelle goes, oh, shame, shame. And then he says, but further to that is that you won the trip to Hawaii with your family. They did the draw this morning. You won, and you didn't stay around long enough. So they asked me to chase you to give you the good news. And he's like, oh, wow. You see? And then the cop says this, listen, my name is Sal, Sal Wami. <laughs> um, I go to Papatoe Seventh-day Adventist Church. I know a little bit about you. I know about your situation. I'm now the commissioner of police for this country. <laughs> and I know you're in a bit of a situation financially, so I'm going to arrest you, which means you have to hop in my car. Leave your jalopy here, hop in my car, and come with me, and I want to show you something. And he takes Joelle, and he drives him to his five-acre farm, and he says, listen, mate, I've got this place that nobody's in. I want you to have it. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Joelle can't believe it. Sal says, hey, listen, I'm just going to drop you off here. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to get your wife and your kids and hopefully they won't run from me like you did. 
You see, when we think of the 23rd Psalm, when he says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, I kind of think of that type of thing. We're so busy running from God when he's trying to chase us because he's got the goods for us. And we're just like, ah. But he's pursuing us hotly so he can deliver to us what we need. The problem with thinking about dwelling in the house of the Lord forever is this, that we focus too much on the house. (laughs) We focus too much on what it looks like. When really, the house is a metaphor once again for Jesus Christ. And what the psalm is saying, ultimately, is I want you to dwell with me. I want you to be with me. Forgot about the banquet, but there's a banquet in this whole scenario as well. There's a banquet. And don't forget when you're in the banquet after you've been through the valley and you're in the banquet and you're feasting. When I think about feasting, I think of Ricky and Ronnie and, and Chip. It's the funniest thing, I've got to say. I think Ronnie's handling it okay, but whenever I look at Ricky... He looks like he's in mortal danger of death. (laughs) But, you know what? He gives you what is good for you. It's just like if if Ricky said to the people that are are running Chip, hey, what's wrong with with palusami? If you don't know what that is, you're missing out. What's wrong with coconut cream and taro? And what's wrong with lamb flaps? That's good stuff. And the Chip leader would say to Ricky, hey, it is good stuff. It's just not good for you. You see, there's the difference. And so he's at the banquet. We're at the banquet feasting. Whenever you're in that feasting time with God, don't ever forget the host. Often we get into our great space and life is good and we forget the host who's putting on the banquet. Don't ever forget the host. Um, Yeah, God pursues me with goodness and mercy. Ultimately, ultimately, this psalm in my reading is about Jesus Christ. It's not about the green pastures. It's not about the still waters. It's not about the house that you can live in forever and ever. It's about Jesus. It's about him. There's a, there's a text that I'd like to pull up right now. Can we go to that? This is how we know. Psalms 27 says this. This is David once again. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek the most, is to live or to dwell in the house of the Lord. Why? All the days of my life. Why? So that I can be delighting in the Lord's perfections. It's not for the streets of gold or the big mansion. It's so that you can delight in his perfections. So here's I kind of want to land this morning. Um, Is there a last slide there? Is this, that the ultimate point of life with God is to learn to delight in Him. That's what Psalms 23 is about, learning to delight in Him, whether you're in green pastures, whether you're going through the valley, whether you're now feasting, and whether you are now dwelling in the house of the Lord. The 23rd Psalm reminds me that letting God lead me restores my spirit. Letting God lead me is good for my soul. And my prayer for you this morning is that you may know that having God as your leader is good for your soul. Having God as your leader is good for your soul. And as you walk this week with God as your leader, knowing and feeling that his leadership in your life is good for your soul, May this relationship between you and God develop where you are acknowledging his perfections and where he continues to shine his face on you. My prayer this morning is that you will live in his presence and that his face will continue to shine on you. God bless you as you go through this week.